here. I was. I got here so early that I was here before you even came in. And then I left. Well, that's good to know. That's good to know. I can I can live with that. Don't keep talking. I'm not ready to teach yet. <laughs> Corey's out of town. <coughs> and, uh, what? I, I, no, I got PowerPoint. What I don't have is this whole whatever this is here. I don't know how to do any of that. Uh, but that's okay. That's okay. I'll survive. Well, good evening, everybody. Very good. We're going to start tonight in uh, Genesis chapter 45. Genesis chapter 45, uh, pretty much where we left off. And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of blitz through the next couple of chapters, hit some high points uh, so we can get into our next topic, which we're going to find all the way in Genesis chapter 49. So that's kind of going to be our roadmap tonight. Start in Genesis 45 and then move our way to 49 and talk about a bigger topic there. But thank you guys so much for class and uh, thanks for braving the rain to be here. And before we get going, I'm going to ask Wally if he's in here. There he is. If he'll lead us in an opening prayer before we start. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that prayer, Wally. Um, so let me start off with just a brief note. Uh, I want to let you know that our class tonight is going to take us to the end of Genesis. So we're going to get uh, 49 and 50, and we're going to kind of get to the whole end of the story. And our next class, next Sunday, is really kind of a, uh, oh, what's the word? Kind of a cafeteria study. So I'm going to kind of go through some of the parts of Genesis that we missed and some of the stories, some of the characters that we missed. And I want to bring that to your attention in case you want to text me this week and say, hey, I really like this part of Genesis. Why didn't we talk about this? Can we talk about this on Sunday so that we can talk about it on Sunday? So if there's any part of Genesis that we missed, any story that you feel like we didn't give enough attention to, uh, that's what the last class is for to talk about those things. So feel free to text me and let me know what you want to talk about. But let's start this class off by, uh, w with this question that should be up there, but it's not. Uh, it's kind of cliche to ask it at this point because it's been asked a million times, but I think it's still a good question. What would you like to have written on your tombstone about you? When you're laid to rest and somebody erects that pretty piece of stone over your grave and they write something on that stone, what would you like it to say about you? How would you like it to sum up your life? Yes, ma'am, Sandy. You do? Does anyone else have theirs written? Just Miss Sandy. That's awesome. Good for you. Well, <laughs> but Sandy, you are only 81. And you're more spry than anybody else in here, I'll tell you that much. Are you going to tell us? Uh-huh. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's right. Commemorating those three children. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. <laughs> His name's on the receipt. <laughs> so, so. Yeah, D. Yeah. What's it say? Yeah, yeah. If you've missed heaven, you've just missed all there is. So that's a pretty important statement. What else? What statement would you like to have written on your tombstone? All right, the same thing that Paul said about himself, right? I fought the fight, I finished the course. That's exactly right. What would you like to have written on your tombstone? No one else? No other thoughts? Anybody else feel like they're really close and got to figure that out soon? You're not going to have a tombstone. That's a pretty odd message to put on a tombstone. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting to think about epitaphs. That's the statement you write on your tombstone. Uh, Because it's almost as if in our death we're making a statement about our lives, right? That's why D has his little tagline at the bottom of his tombstone, because that's what he said at the end of all of his sermons. If you missed heaven, you've just missed all there is. And you want to commemorate your children, right? This is something that was special to me. I want to say something important happened to me in my life, and that was these three children. That's an important thing. And so when we make these inscriptions on our graves, we're making a statement by the way that we die. In death, we're making a resounding statement about our lives. And that's one thing that's interesting about Genesis is, while they're not inscribing things on tombstones, people make statements about their lives by the way that they die. Uh, Can you think of an example of that in the book of Genesis? Somebody who by their death makes a statement about how they lived. In the book of Genesis. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Only, only like many thousands of years off. Just, but that's okay. That is a good point. He did make a statement in how he died. Okay. How so? Yeah. Yeah. So the fact that he didn't take his death, right, says something. He was not. He pleased God that God took him. I didn't have that one written down, but that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Yeah, I'm not quite sure what to make of that, but that definitely does say something about his life, doesn't it? What else? Who can you think of makes a statement about their life by the way they die? There are two that I'm really thinking of. That Abel, right? Why do you say Abel? Absolutely. Hebrews 11 talks about how he being dead still speaks, right? And it testifies that he was faithful because he was, he was killed because he offered a sacrifice that was faithful to God. And so in his death, by being killed by his brother, he makes a statement about the kind of person that he was. There's one other person I'm thinking about, not a good person. Lot's wife. Yes, sir. Why do you say her? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is interesting. That's one thing that we didn't cover uh, when we talked about Sodom and Gomorrah. We, talked about the, we didn't talk about the death of Lot's wife. But that says something about her. The angel said, do not turn around. And what does she do? She turns around. Which brings up the question, why? Why did she turn around? Why do you think she turned around? Morbid curiosity. Yeah, and I think that's really the point of her story. Is She has a, a heart that is too attached to the things of this world, the things that she had in Sodom. And so she turns around because she's, she's not setting her hand to the plow, like Jesus said. She's turning around, and she wants to look back on what she had. And for that reason, she proves herself unworthy to be saved. At least that's the way that I interpret that story. And so we see that's true of Abel's death and Enoch's life. We see that's true of Lot's wife. And we also see that that's true of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, Leah, and Joseph. All of them make a statement about the way they lived and what they believed by the way that they die. They make a statement not exactly by the way that they die, but by where they choose to be buried. All of those people, except for Joseph, are buried in the same place. Where are they buried? In the cave of Machpelah. And so I want to talk to you a little bit 
about the cave of Machpelah and what that says about the people who were buried there, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, and Leah. But as I said, before we get there, I do want to kind of run through Genesis 45, 46, 47, 48. So as we ended our class last time, J uh, Joseph revealed himself to his brothers, and he sent his brothers back to get his father and bring his father to Egypt. Now there's one interesting, that happens, interesting thing that happens at the end of chapter 45, and it says this in verse 21, Genesis 45, 21, the sons of Israel did this. Joseph gave them wagons as Pharaoh had commanded. He gave them provisions for the journey. He gave each of the brothers changes of clothes, but he gave Benjamin 300 pieces of silver and five changes of clothes. He sent his father the following, 10 donkeys carrying the best products of Egypt and 10 female donkeys carrying grain, food, and provisions for his father on the journey. Joseph sent his brothers on their way, and as they were leaving, he said to them what? Don't argue on the way. That raises the question. Argue about what? What do you think he's telling them not to argue about? What do you mean? Okay, so maybe don't argue about whether or not to go back to Egypt or not. Maybe, yeah. Okay, maybe don't argue about the fact that I gave Benjamin more than I gave you guys. That's exactly right, because they sold Joseph into slavery because he got the coat of many colors. Any other ideas? Yes, ma'am. That's the other possibility, because think about what they're going to have to tell dad. Hey, Joseph's alive, so that means that all these years ago we did what? Yeah, we lied. So he might be telling them, don't argue about how you're going to fess up, right? Don't, Reuben, don't stand there and be like, I told you guys not to do it. It wasn't my fault, right? And so he's, he might be telling them, hey, don't argue about that stuff. And really, he's telling them that that's not really the important thing. The important thing is that I'm alive and that I want you to come to Egypt so I can take care of you. What happened all those years ago? doesn't really matter. So it's interesting that he says that. Not quite sure what that means. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so maybe they quarrel more and more when they when they get blessed a little bit more. That could be it as well. I want you to see this. We get into Genesis chapter 46, and this is where they come back. They tell their father. Interesting that it doesn't record the conversation between the brothers and the dad. I would love to know how that went. But it says this in verse 1, Israel set out with all that he had, and he came to Beersheba, and he offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. That night God spoke to Israel in a vision. Jacob, Jacob, he said. And Jacob replied, here I am. God said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. For I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you back. Joseph will close your eyes when you die. So the brothers are trying to bring Jacob to Egypt, and he gets up and he goes. And when they come to Beersheba, which is important for a couple of reasons, Beersheba is a border city. So it is right on the cusp of the promised land, right before he's about to leave the promised land. And so it's almost like God is saying, hey, Abraham and Isaac got in trouble when they left the promised land. I want you to know what? It's okay that you're leaving, right? This is part of my plan. It's also important because this is a place where uh, this is a place where Abraham worshipped God, and so he's following in the footsteps of his grandfather by offering worship to God here. It's interesting that he says to Jacob, God said, verse 3, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you back. What is the significance of him saying, I will go down with you to Egypt? Why is that important to them? Yeah. So it's important to remember, I think that's exactly right, it's important to remember that these people know so little about God, um, right? They only know what 
They, they don't even know all the things that we know reading this far into the book of Genesis. And they don't even have the rest of the Bible like we do. There's so much they don't understand. And polygamous cultures really did believe that gods were tied to certain locations. And so it very easily could have, he very easily could have thought, well, God is the God of Canaan. He has dominion here. So if I leave Canaan, I leave, I leave his care. I leave his protection and his providence. And God wants to make sure he knows, no, I'm the kind of God that goes with you. I'm not confined by any location. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which, what does Bethel mean? Who knows what the name, what the name means? Yeah, it's the house of God. So that gives credence to that idea. And so he lets him know, I'm going to go down with you, and I want you to know that it's okay for you to leave. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's true. So they go down to Egypt, and they arrive in the land of Goshen, which is interesting because the land of Goshen is not necessarily close to all the regular Egyptian people. And so there's this shadow here of the idea that God's people are in the world, right? But they are, they are what? They're still separated from the world. In fact, there's a part of the story that says that Egyptians considered all shepherds to be odious, right? And so they were disgusted by them and didn't want to be around them, which is very interesting when you think about how that parallels the Christianity, right? We are in the world, but we're still separated from the world, and the world looks at us sometimes and and kind of has a distaste for us in the way that we live. I also want you to notice what it says. Before Jacob gets to the promise, uh, before he gets to Egypt, it says in verse 28 that Jacob sent one son ahead of him. Which one does he choose? He chooses Judah, even more to my point that Judah is the one who takes the lead and becomes the favored son because of his good choice and his transformation that we talked about in the last class. Now we come to Genesis chapter 47. Jacob has arrived in Egypt, and Joseph is going to introduce him to Pharaoh. And something important happens here in verse 7. Listen to what it says here. Joseph then brought his father Jacob and presented him, other translations would say stood him, to Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, how many years have you lived? Is there a significance in that? What do you see in that verse that sticks out to you? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's exactly right. And it's it's interesting that Pharaoh concedes to that, but he does. He does. Hebrews does make that point, and earlier in the book of Genesis, we see that story with Melchizedek that proves that point, that it is always, without exception, the greater that blesses the lesser. Think about it in these terms. If I were to stand up on Sunday and say, you know, Don, I think in my great wisdom that you're an awesome preacher and you did a fantastic job and I want you to feel good that I think you're awesome. That sounds kind of weird coming from me, doesn't it? Because I'm a 31-year-old guy and he's been doing this for how many years? So there's at least 80 so there's something, there's something backwards, right, about the younger or the lesser blessing the greater. Now, if Don were to get up and say that about me, that would be a great blessing, and that would make sense to people because the greater or the older usually blesses the younger or the lesser. And so that's exactly what's happening here, and it says something important that Pharaoh sees something special in Jacob, that he is willing to receive the blessing and humble himself to receive the blessing of this great man. And so I think that's important to point out. Now, when we get to, we get to Genesis chapter 48, we have an interesting story with, um, I turned my page in my notes, meant to turn my page in my Bible, sorry. We have this interesting story where Jacob brings Joseph's sons to him, and he blesses those two sons. And in that, we see another inversion, where the younger is the one who is blessed as opposed to the older. So in verse 13, 
it says, Then Joseph took them both with his right hand Ephraim toward Israel's left, and with his left hand Manasseh toward Israel's right, and he brought them to Israel. But Israel stretched out his right hand and put it on the head of Ephraim, the younger, and crossing his hands, he put his left on Manasseh's head, although Manasseh was the firstborn. And so this is a recapitulation of what happens earlier, of what happens in Jacob's life, uh, except this time there's no deception involved. Jacob says he's going to choose the lesser over the greater. He's going to bless the lesser in a greater way uh, than, than the, older, the, the older child. It's interesting, though, that he doesn't do what his dad does. Because when Isaac blesses Jacob on accident, when Esau comes and says, is there no blessing left for me? What's the answer? No, there ain't nothing left for you. But when it comes to these two boys, he reserves a good blessing for both of the boys. And I think that's interesting. It shows a little bit of character development from Isaac into, into Jacob. But when we get into chapter 49, and this is where I really want to be, Jacob is on his deathbed. He's bringing his sons to him, and he wants to talk to them about what's going to happen in the days to come. One thing that I want you to notice about what we just covered is there, there are several little instances where we, look, where we see uh, this family looking forward to the future. So it would be really easy for this group of people, a group of 70 people, to say, okay, we're leaving the land of Canaan. We're set up in a good position with Joseph, and so we're going to make our home in the land of Egypt. This is where we're going to be. We feel safe here. We're going to leave Canaan behind. But in several different ways, or a couple of different ways, you see they still hold out hope that they're going to come back to Canaan. So remember in Genesis 46, in verse 4, God tells Jacob, when you leave, don't worry, I'm going to go down with you, and what? And I'm going to bring you back. In Genesis 48, when Jacob is blessing his two grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh, he blesses one of them by saying, I'm going to give you this mountain slope that I took from the Amorites. Which is interesting. Where is that mountain slope located? It's located in the promised land. And so again, we're looking forward to what's going to happen in the future. Even though they're going to Egypt, everyone still believes that they're ultimately going to come back to Canaan one day. And you see that no more clearly than you see it with the cave of Machpelah and everything that's involved with that. So look in, in Genesis 49, verse 28. This is where Jacob is about to die. And he gives them his burial instructions. It says, verse 28, These are the tribes of Israel, twelve in all. And this is what the Father said to them. He blessed them, and he blessed each one with a suitable blessing. Then he commanded them, I am about to, about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my ancestors in the cave in the field of Ephron the Hethite. The cave is in the field of Machpelah near Mamre in the land of Canaan. This is the field Abraham purchased from Ephron the Hethite as burial property. Abraham, Abraham and his wife Sarah are buried there. Isaac and his wife Rebekah are buried there. And I buried Leah there. The field and the cave in it were purchased from the Hethites. And so as Jacob is passing from this earth, he requests that when he dies, he wants his sons to take him all the way back to the land of Canaan so he can be buried in that one burial plot where all the other ancestors are buried. And he does that because it's a statement. In his death, he's making a statement about what he believes. What does he believe? That we're going back. That God's going to make good on his promise. I don't know how long it's going to take. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know how many generations are going to pass until it comes true. But I know I want to be buried there because I know that's where the people, that's where my people, my family is going to be eventually. So look at what it says. Genesis chapter 15. Sorry, that sounds like 15. Genesis 50. When Jacob finally dies, that's exactly what his sons do. 50 verse 1, Then Joseph, leaning over his father's face, wept and kissed him. He commanded his servants, who were physicians, to embalm his father, so they embalmed Israel. They took 40 days to complete this, for embalming takes that long, and the Egyptians mourned for him 70 days. When the days of mourning were over, pause, isn't that cool that the Egyptians mourned for this guy who just got there? That's a testament to how great a man this was. Verse 4, when the days of mourning were over, Joseph said to Pharaoh's household, If I have found favor with you, please tell Pharaoh that my father made me take an oath, saying, I am about to die. You must bury me there in the tomb that I made for myself in the land of Canaan. Now let me go and bury my father, then I will return. So Pharaoh said, Go, 
and bury your father in keeping with your oath. Then Joseph went to bury his father and all Pharaoh's servants, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt went with him, along with all Joseph's family, his brothers and his father's family. Only their dependents, their flocks and their herds were left in the land of Goshen. Horses and chariots went up with him. It was a very impressive procession. When they reached the threshing floor of Atad, which is across the Jordan, they lamented and wept loudly, and Joseph mourned seven days for his father. When the Canaanite inhabitants of the land saw the mourning at the threshing floor of Atad, they said, this is a solemn mourning on the part of the Egyptians. Therefore, the place is named Abel Mizraim. It is across the Jordan. So Jacob's sons did for him what he had commanded them. They carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave at Machpelah in the field near Mamre, which Abraham had purchased as a burial property from Ephron the Hethite. After Joseph buried his father, he returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone with him to bury his father. And so Jacob joins his family in death. And when he, when he dies, he has his children take him all the way back to that cave so that he can be laid aside all of those other ancestors that had passed away. And ultimately what Jacob is saying in that is that he believes that they're going to come back. What he's saying in that is that he has hope. He has not just a wish, he doesn't just, you know, wish or think it would be really good if, if God would make good on his promise, but he actually, he hopes, which in the Bible is not just a wish, it is a what? It's an expectation, right? He has an expectation that his family is going to be back there. Even though, even though he doesn't know how long it's going to be, he has hope that his family will return. And he's not the only one who has hope in that, because we see that his son Joseph after he passes away, gives not the same instructions, but very similar instructions. So look at what happens when Joseph passes away. Genesis chapter 50 and verse 22. Joseph and his father's family remained in Egypt. Joseph lived 110 years. He saw Ephraim's son to the third generation. The sons of Manasseh's son, Machir, were recognized by Joseph. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will certainly come to your aid and bring you up from this land to the land that he swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Joseph made the sons of Israel take an oath. When God comes to your aid, you are to carry up my bones from here. Joseph died at the age of 110. They embalmed him and placed him in a coffin in Egypt. So again, Joseph doesn't do exactly the same thing. He doesn't ask that they take his body after he dies, take him all the way back to the land of Canaan, and bury him in the cave of Machpelah. And that's interesting. Why do, you think, why do you think he doesn't ask them to do exactly the same thing? No, that's wrong. It's because they're out of room. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, you say because he's more connected to Egypt. Yeah, I think you're right. At least that's what I wrote down. You think about that. It's, it's possible that he felt a very, very deep connection to Egypt, that it would have felt more like home to him than anywhere else. How long had he been in Egypt? Since he was 17, he lived to 110. Do you do fast math? How many years is that? Okay. I don't know how many years that is. Like 93. There we go. Yes, sir. And I think that is a statement, that you guys are going to come back with me. I know that you're going to leave, so I don't have to do like, you take me right away just in case it doesn't work out, right? No. He says, when, when you leave, take me with you. That's actually exactly what happens. If you go to Joshua 24, 32, we have a little snippet where it says, they took up Joseph's bones, they took him, and they buried him in the promised land after they had conquered it. I do think there's another possibility that he chose to be buried in Egypt. And... The, uh, Let's see. It says they embalmed him and placed him in a coffin in Egypt. So maybe he was just in a coffin. Yeah, it could have been. 
I guess I don't know what you mean by. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So you're saying you think his his tomb was somewhere that everybody knew about? Oh, that's certainly possible. That's certainly possible. Yeah, yeah. He was placed in a coffin, in a mausoleum or something. I uh, regardless, regardless. I understand what you're saying. I uh, I do think there's another possibility why he didn't just go straight to Canaan, and that might be because he's intended to be a shadow of Christ. Because you think about what. Joseph is going to do when his people leave and they go to the promised land he's going to leave what behind if he's buried in Egypt and they pick up his bones and they take him what does he leave behind he leaves behind an empty tomb which is exactly what Jesus does when he rises from the dead he leaves behind an empty tomb so it could be that this is part of God's plan and he's intended to be a shadow of Christ I don't know if that's true it just popped up in my mind when I read through that. Yes, sir. Yeah. So what you see in all of this, what you see with the cave of Machpelah, is that it comes to represent hope that these people lived with an undeniable expectation that God would make good on his promise. And I don't know about you, but I, I'm really amazed by that. I think that's really incredible. Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, Leah, Joseph, that they were so sure of this promise. What makes that hope that they had so impressive to you? Yeah, yeah, so it's very much like our hope, yes, sir? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, but I think they had more compelling pieces of evidence, maybe, but I, I think that's one of the things that I wrote down, at least I'm, I'm in favor of Kevin's idea, that, that they were able to build that hope and that faith without all the stories that we have to build our hope and faith, right? When you build your faith, right, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so when we read the word of God, we read about these stories, everything that God has done, that's what builds our faith. We say, oh, God can help me conquer this because I read the story of David and Goliath. And I know that as scary as that was, if I'm courageous and I stick with God, he'll see me through. And we have all kinds of stories in the Bible about that. And they've got... <laughs> None of that, right? They don't have David and Goliath. They don't have Daniel in the lion's den. I don't know what they taught in their teen weekends if they didn't. <laughs> but you think, about, you think about all the stories in the Bible that reinforce your faith in God, and they're all probably post-Genesis stories. And they built this hope without any of that information, without any of those stories to reinforce them. There's something incredible about them that they were able to build their hope on this God that revealed himself to them in the land of Canaan. Now, God obviously went out of his way to speak to them directly, right? And that probably enabled them to have more hope um, without, with less information, but still. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. A story that would have taught them about the providence of God and how God works and... Yeah, that's exactly right. Yes, sir, Mr. Kaskaro. Kashiro, sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. But it is amazing to me. It's amazing to me that they're able to build their hope. And I look at I look at my hope, right? I look at my faith and how sometimes I don't really believe what God has promised and I don't really step out on that branch and trust him to come through and do what he promised he would do. And I'm put to shame by the fact that these guys these guys are willing to bury themselves in Canaan. And and, and that, that really, really impresses me. So I'm I'm impressed that they built that hope without all the stories that we have to build our hope. I'm also impressed that they built that hope despite the, the, the strength and the power of the Canaanites. Uh, it's, it's amazing to me, because 400 years later, their descendants are going to lose their faith, even though they've seen so much more, right? And so they're in the land of Canaan. They see how strong and powerful these people are, and they still have hope. 400 years later... What's going to happen? Their descendants are going to come. They're going to come to the brink of the promised land. They're going to spy out the land. They're going to see the people there and say, what? Uh Uh-uh. And after they'd seen everything that they had seen, they saw the ten plagues in Egypt. They saw the, 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 I almost said the Nile. The Red Sea parted. They saw the Jordan River parted. They walked by both of those on dry ground, and yet they still lose their faith and lose their hope when they see the people of the land. And so it's amazing to me that these people are, still have that hope even though they see 